Hi Dragonflies, this video was recorded live during my second Sunday live demo on 10 March 2019. Um, and this is my, uh, I guess this is a trendy thing to talk about your everyday carry. I have this little pouch that I take, this is what I take with me every day. It slides down, and I think you can see it's, it's not very large, it's probably about six by nine inches. And inside this is everything that I need to paint in the field, except for my sketchbook. And so I can pull this out, put it in my backpack, and I always have everything I need to go sketching. And I have found that um, I do a lot more sketching if I can just pick up and go than if I have to pack everything. So let me show you what's in here. This is my basic set. First of all, I have one of these little metal watercolor palettes. And it has Velcro dots on the bottom. And the reason it has Velcro dots is this is my little lap board. It's just a cutting board. And I can put my palette on the Velcro dots. And now I can pick it up and carry it around. I can put it on my lap and it's not going to slide off. Next, I have a cloth to wipe my um, brush on or blot things so I don't have to use a million paper towels or carry a whole bunch of paper towels with me. I have a water bottle and I have this cute little shot glass cup that collapses. Now this is, I honestly, partly this is just because it's fun. I used to have a little rubber one that collapsed, but, but I couldn't stick Velcro dots on the rubber one either. So this also gets stuck on my lap board. And then if I don't fill it too much, again, I can sit with this on my knees, I can carry it around, I can work with it standing if I need to. And then I just put whatever I'm working on over on this side. A lot of times I just carry with me, instead of a sketchbook, a lot of times I carry just individual postcard sized pieces of paper and I can tape them right here. Okay, next. Oh, and if I'm somewhere where I do not want to dump water out, I don't have a drain um, to dump it down and I don't want to dump it on the ground, I actually leave this bottle empty. I use my drinking water bottle to fill my cup and then I use this as my dirty water reservoir. All right, next I have some tape for taping things down, my trusty spray bottle. I have been, as many of you know, I have been working on little pieces of watercolor board, making these little bitty paintings. And um, so I carry some of those in my... Lynn, we have a question from Sheila who wants to know if your lap board has velcro on it the lap board has yes good question maybe you can't see them the lap board has dots that match the dots on the back of the things that i'm sticking to it does that answer your question sheila okay. yep it does yes. And, and as long as I'm at it, I might, might as well just tell you if you, haven't, if you haven't done this before, here's how you make them match. You put the dots on the item that you're going to stick down, and then you take these dots and you stick them adhesive side up onto each of those dots, and then you put the whole business down the first time, and they will glue themselves in the correct locations. So. Now that I know that, I use Velcro dots for everything. They're all over the place. All right, I use tube colors, and so I carry in my pouch some tube colors, although I don't usually have to refill them in the field. I can usually refill them. But I should, I know there are gonna be questions about tube colors versus pan colors, so let me just take a moment to talk about that. Um, Tube colors, some brands like Graham, for example, or Sennelier have a lot of honey in them. 
and they will run all over the inside of your palate and never completely dry, no matter how long you leave them to dry. And so you have to be careful about what brands you put into a palette like this if you're going to use tube colors. Um, honestly, I'm using tube colors partly because I have so many of these little tubes from years ago and I kind of need to use them up. Pan colors are formulated for this kind of thing. They won't run all over the place and they dissolve more quickly. They have less gum arabic in them. So once I use up all my tube colors, I'll probably go to pan colors, but you might be in the same situation. If you do go to pan colors, um, the brand that I like to use is Schmincke, and it's a, it, Schmincke is a German brand, and they, um, they have the widest line, color line that I know of for pan colors. They're, and they're fairly available in the US. You can usually find them, if not in your local store, um, online, they're easy to find. Can you uh, spell that for the chat? Schminka? Um, actually, it's S-C-H-M-I-N-K-E, but um, oh. I should have said this at the beginning. I made a handout that lists all these products that I'm talking about just for oh, that awesome. kind of question so that you don't have to take notes. But I decided not to send it to you ahead of time because I know that I will probably think of things as we're talking or someone will ask questions. So I'll probably add some things to it and then I'll email that to everybody um, okay, tomorrow or good. the next day. Yeah. All right. And then that doesn't even belong in there. I have a little bit, a uh, little bitty uh, template, and I use this mostly for the little circles to do sun or moon. And then uh, another support to put another piece of paper on while something is drying. Some tissues, a pencil, a very squished natural sponge. This is a rubber cement pickup corner. I just cut it up so I didn't have to carry the whole thing. I know I'm going kind of quickly, so if there's something that you're, you don't know what that is, feel free to ask. Um, a kneaded eraser, and I put them in a little plastic container because they otherwise collect all kinds of leaves and debris and junk like that. So a kneaded eraser, a piece of saran wrap because I use it all the time for stamping and you can just wipe it off and use it again. Some business cards, another little, um, this is my expired National Park Pass from last year that I just cut up and used. I'm sure you guys have done this too, using to make little um, lines or scrape and I punched a couple of holes in it so I also don't really have to have that and then this one is on the list this is a PBO masking fluid they call it a marker but it's really more like a pen and this guy is great you won't be able to see it but there but I saved a couple of uh, pieces that I've marked and you see how fine a line it makes so if you need to do something like a boat mast or these little reflections yes that um, that's in the list so the PBO marker is in the list and then there is another version if you want a thicker line I don't know if this is pronounced Molotov probably Molotov um, and this one, I refilled this. You can refill all of them. I refilled it. It normally has blue in it. But this is a pump style marker, and it makes a little bit thicker line. But both of them are actually surprisingly good at not getting clogged up in the field. So that's a way that you can bring um, a little bit of masking fluid to the field to do things like thin lines. Or an alternative is to bring a little bit of white paint to the field with you, which some people do too. And then I have uh, more brushes in here than I need, actually. Um, and the reason for that is uh, some of these I use with acrylics. So um, we'll just put those away. 
So I have a one inch flat, a half inch flat, and one of these uh, collapsible travel brushes. This one is an Escoda Prado, and this is a really nice brush. It's a, a sable synthetic blend, but you don't need to buy a brush this expensive. On the list, I found some on Amazon of all places. Um, one of the things that you can buy from China that's pretty good quality is brushes. People in China know how to make brushes. They've been doing it for thousands of years. So I found some, it's a little set of three, they're synthetic brushes, but they come to a nice point. The only uh, disadvantage to them is that they don't fit as snugly, and so I had to take a pair of pliers and squeeze the um, tube a little bit to keep them snug enough but it's a pretty good buy so if you don't have a travel brush and you've been wanting one that's on the list and that's a kind of a nice option so uh oh, sorry question uh yeah jc was asking if the uh brand and model of the bag was also on the list of the bag yeah your little bag yes it there. is yeah. yes it is awesome. Awesome, the little, awesome. These are sold as um, organizers for like briefcases or purses or backpacks or something. And um, I did put that on, on the list too. Yep. The next thing I have in here is uh, sometimes I don't want to get all my brushes out and I don't want to get my water out. I just want to do some color really quick. So I have a little bitty water brush. And there are a bunch of options for water brushes. But, uh, and this, I put this on the list too. The main thing to know about water brushes is the brush part, they come in different sizes and shapes, but they all are pretty much the same quality. It's not like there's a, a better one or a worse one. You really can't go wrong. So the primary difference is what size do you want, and that's personal preference, and how do you fill it, and how big do you want it to be, how long. So there's this little teeny weeny one, and there are some that are longer. So longer one has more water in it, teeny weeny one fits in smaller pouches. The only one that's a little bit unusual, this one is made by Niji, and this is on the list, so you don't have to write it down. It's the only one I know of um, where that's readily available where you have a flat version. So that's a possibility. And the nice thing about these guys, for those of you who haven't, if any of you have not used one, is if I'm somewhere where I don't want to get all this water out and I'm just working in my sketchbook, I don't have to have rinse water. I can squeeze this a little bit, get some water out, mix some color, paint with it, and then when I want to switch colors, instead of rinsing this like we would normally rinse, all I have to do is squeeze it to force a little bit more water through the bristles, and now it's clean. Well, almost clean. <laughs> now it's clean. And so then I can switch to a different color, and I don't have to carry water at all except drinking water. And you can rinse it if you want to, but you don't have to. So that means if I want to carry just a little bit of supplies with me, I can carry a little water brush like this, and I can fill it from my drinking water, since the brush end never goes in the water, and go all day long with just this little brush and not have to worry about where do I dump my dirty water. I have to carry all kinds of water. I need to have some place where I can put a cup. So this allows me to just work with just the palette, my sketchbook, and the water brush, and then a towel to wipe my water brush on. Now this little water brush, um, this is the uh, Koi or Sakura water brush, and I want to tell you something about this one just in case, and some of you are going to start laughing because I think some of you have been with me. When I've been teaching class, and we're like, try to unscrew the thing, and we can't get it to unscrew. And it took me a while to learn that in Japan, the, the uh, standard threading is the opposite of what it is in the US. <laughs> so if you want to unscrew it, you have to turn it the opposite direction. <laughs> and I think it took us about a half an hour to figure that out the first time. So if I can save anybody that, and, and my fingers don't want to do it. The rest of them operate pretty much like um, 
or operate the standard threading the way we have in the U.S. And then the last thing I have is a um, dip pen. And this is one of those covers that they make for um, covering up a uh, oil brush until you can get it home so you don't get oil paint all over everything. And I put it on here just to keep that pointy end from poking through things or getting bent. So you might wonder why would I have a dip brush if I'm working in the field. And the reason I have a dip brush is now I can draw lines of any color that I like. And you do not have to have enough to dip a dip brush. You can load a dip brush with a paintbrush like this. Let me do it over here. I think it's probably hard to see over there. So I mix up my color, whatever color I want, and then I just take the brush and drop the color into the dip pen. And now I can draw lines with my dip pen. That means I can draw little details with the dip pen. It also means I can do line and wash with a watercolor color instead of black ink. So that's kind of nice sometimes if you don't, if you want to do line and wash, but you don't want the intensity of a black line. So that's, that's what I carry every day. It rides around in my backpack. It's always in my car. I always have it. And I can pull it out and practice with it around the house too. I can take it out, grab my sketchbook. And so I know exactly where everything is in here when I go to the field and it makes my life in the field a lot easier. One of the things that I've discovered over the years, and any of you who've done field sketching, I'm sure you know this, is the minute you get in the field, everything gets much harder because the wind is blowing, the sun is shining and drying things out faster than you would expect in the studio. The bugs are landing and the bees are in your paint and you know all those things, all those distractions. So if you know where things are and you can just grab something and, and not have to search for it, you're much more likely to have a successful time and an enjoyable time out in the field. But this is a fair amount of stuff. It's not very heavy, but you know, it's not what I would call something that you could put in your pocket. So what if I do want something I can put in my pocket? So I'm going to show you next my uh, traveling setup. If I know that I can't take this much stuff, I've got to carry it in my pocket, or especially if I'm traveling with other people who are not artists, and they're all going to sit there and go, after about two minutes, if you're not an artist sketching something, a couple of minutes looking at a scene is if people are ready to move on. And so they're sitting there going, uh, are you, can we go have lunch? Are you done? We want to see the next, the next thing. And you're just feeling like you just got started. So here's my solution to that problem. Well, stand by just a minute. Tried to put everything within reach, but I have so many things to show you. So uh, Kathleen is asking about the little watercolor boards. She uh, would Let's... just like a little bit of a description of what those are. Oh, okay. So, um, so the question is, what is a watercolor board? Yeah, what is it? Why would? Why do you use them? Okay. So if you've been following my newsletter, you may have seen these little paintings that I'm calling Tiny Escapes. And watercolor board is a, it's about the thickness of mat board. So let's see if I can put it on edge so you can see it. It's about the thickness of mat board and it's rigid like mat board. So it's stiff, it's not like paper, but it's got a watercolor paper surface on it. So it's kind of nice when you take it to the field because you don't have to tape it to a support. It won't buckle unless you really get it soaked. And then you can, you can just hold it in your hand. And then what I do with them 
is uh, then I have these little tiny paintings like this that I can mount. So these serve as my thumbnail sketches and also the ones that turn out nice I can mount and actually sell. So, and there are also ways for me to do like planning studies for um, larger paintings. So I started doing it actually because um, they were easy to hold in my hand and I didn't have to tape them down and they don't buckle and they're rigid. But um, then I decided they're such a great size for thumbnails, I'd do thumbnails with them and then I thought, you know, some of them turn out kind of cool so p other people might like them too. So that's why the watercolor board. Um, watercolor board is getting harder to find though. Um, Arsh used to make it and they don't make it anymore and I believe you have to order it now from, I think Canson makes a watercolor board and Crescent makes a watercolor board. So you have to kind of search around for it. Does that answer your question, Kathleen? Maybe, yes, okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. So back to what if what if I'm not going to carry all of that stuff, and I'm traveling, and especially if I'm traveling by plane, and I want to be able to um, do some sketching on the plane, then what I like to do is take watercolor pencils. And when I first started using watercolor pencils, when they first came out, I wasn't real fond of them because. I make a line like that, and then let's get a different color, like this one, maybe. So those both look kind of grayish, and then you come in with a water brush, say, and you get them wet, and you discover that, oh my gosh, that one's blue, and that one's sort of a magenta. So I would always, it would always be a big surprise to me and not always a pleasant surprise what color I got when I would try to blend them with my water brush. So I wasn't, I, I didn't think they were a real great, great solution because I like to be able to lay a wash of some sort. I did like that you could draw with them, but I didn't like that I couldn't lay a wash. And this solved that problem for me. So what this is, is a piece of, it's, um, this one's actually, plastic that's used for making quilt templates, for quilters used to make the templates that they use to cut things out. And the important part about it is the surface is kind of frosted. And so if I scribble on it with one of these pencils, there's enough tooth to that surface to take some of the color off. And then I can reconstitute it over here on my little baby plastic palette and I know exactly what color I've got. Oops, let's get it all dissolved. And I can use it to lay washes. And I can blend them. So if I think, oh, you know, I want I want more of a rust color or orangey color. I can mix on my little palette. So this means that I have a, a painting tool and a drawing tool all in one little pouch, one little holder. And when I need a clean space, I just wipe it off. If you're one of those people who loves to buy supplies and you need some new supplies to buy, Karen Dash has made a palette specifically for watercolor pencils that's a little bit heavier duty and has the little thumb hole and everything, and it's, it's got that frosted surface as well. So you can actually now buy one of these. Um, and it's actually kind of nice because it's big enough. Um, well, I've lost my, it's big enough for postcard size piece of watercolor paper here. And then you can use just this edge to, um, to get your color going. So that's a complete kit. All you need is your watercolor pencils, a palette like this, or a piece of frosted plastic that you stick inside and something to wipe your water brush on. 
and you can paint little postcard sized paintings with with that and that's all that you need and so there's no liquids aerosols or gels I don't have to worry about carrying it on a plane it all fits into a pocket and if I have postcard sized paper that's that's my kit right there and a towel and that's all I need and I don't have to carry water because I can use my drinking water to refill my water brush or instead of the postcard size paper you could use a sketchbook if you like a little bit bolder color you can do the very same thing with watercolor markers and this again will be on the um, handout not every marker in fact not very many markers do this most markers are um, solvent based so when you get them wet they don't blend but these markers these are Tombow T-O-M-B-O-W Tombow markers and they are water based and they actually blend out beautifully and you can do the same thing with the markers you can scribble on the plastic blend them on the plastic and use them just like paints from a palette. So if you decide you want to go the marker route, um, and some people like them because when you're just using the straight marker, that's a brighter color than the watercolor pencils. Make sure you're getting water soluble ones <laughs> because not every one of them is, most of them are not. And uh, it won't work if they're not water soluble. I have found a couple of kids markers, washable kids markers that work like this, but other than that, the only art version I know is the Tombow marker. Oh, uh, okay, so there's a question about the, the water, <laughs> somebody's already out there looking for watercolor board. Um, yes, they're not, I cut those down. I get out my, um, utility knife and a long ruler and some clamps and I cut them down to size. I take an afternoon and cut them all down to this little bitty size. They're usually, usually this, I think you can find um, eight by tens now. I think Canson makes watercolor board that is eight by 10. That's probably about the smallest. Other than that, they're, you know, they used to only be sold like mat board 32 by 40, so. All right, one more, even more minimal version of, if, if all of that is too much to carry, then I can go down to this. And you might be thinking, well, there's no watercolor involved. Well, there sort of isn't, you're right. But this is the most um, simple, pure version of line and wash, and that is to use a water soluble line. Now this pen makes a really heavy line. I don't normally take this one but I'm doing it so that you can see. So I'm drawing with black ink here and then I take my water brush or any other brush and I can move that ink as long as it's a water soluble ink. So you'll have to test this. Um, most pens, most gel pens so this is just that was a nice this is a nice um, fountain pen but this is just your basic uh, office type uh, it's a uniball gel grip whatever most office type gel pens also will do this but they don't have as rich an ink as a fountain pen ink so you don't get as much shading now, this is line and wash, but this is a really simple line and wash, but it's actually really kind of cool. So I'm going to just do a little here. We'll just use the, um, the silly little cup. So when I, do, when I use these um, to sketch in the field, it works best if you restate the lines a lot. And that's so that you now have a lot of ink to work with when you go to create your your wash. So there's our little shot glass. And that looks really crude and ugly at that point, 
But it's almost magical what happens as soon as you start to add a little shading with your water brush to this crude and ugly drawing. Suddenly it's like, oh, well that's not so bad after all. That actually looks kind of cool. And so this is, I, I feel like I'm doing a lot um, something very similar to what I'd be doing with watercolor here because I'm use, using that fluid quality but it's just black and white and it's very quick and it's very very portable so this is like my very most minimal um, way of of sketching in the field and still sort of doing what I do as a watercolorist which is you know using water to move things and being able to shade things like this so that's, that's like the most simple um, possible, most simple, most portable possible uh, kit to take to the field. Now, I haven't talked about the other end, that what if you want to paint bigger paintings? Then I'm doing all this little tiny stuff. What if you like to work bigger and you were really hoping to hear about all those pochade boxes and stuff like that? So um, let me talk about that briefly, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about sketchbooks, but let me talk about working bigger. So I have had a bunch of different um, easel systems and boxes and so forth, and I have found that um, that's all a recipe for me to not go sketching, because it's too much to haul around in the field. But if you do want to do that, what I recommend, and this is on the list, and I can't show you all of it because I don't have all of it anymore, but there is a company called uh, Plein Air Pro, Plein Air Easel Pro, something like that. Anyway, it's on the list. And the easel basically is a shelf that, that latches onto um, the front of a camera tripod, and then they've got a, a board that screws onto the top of the camera tripod. I don't have a solution for the shelf, which is, I think it's about 40 bucks um, for the shelf, but, and the board is also, the whole system is over $100. Um, if you happen to already have a camera tripod, what you can do is go to the hardware store, and this is a T-nut, and it is a one quarter inch by 20 pitch, and that'll be on the handout. So you see it's got this little hole in it that's threaded and then it's got these little spikes. And you can take it and stick it on your, um, your gator board and just press and it'll punch right in just like a staple does. Now if I were going to use this in the field a lot I would add a little glue to this. And then all you have to do is take the the mount that you normally would put on the bottom of your camera and you screw that into the little screw into the nut and this clips in to your camera tripod just like it does when it has a camera on it so you can put this on the top of your camera tripod you can put the shelf on the tripod so if, if you're wanting to go to the field for a watercolorist, we do not need something to clamp a, a canvas. We need a surface to tape things to. And there's no reason why we need to buy something that's 50 bucks when we can buy a 20 cent T-nut. If you happen to have a camera tripod, you're all set. So that's my solution to, and that's all I'm really gonna say about those bigger systems because I, I have found my recommendation would be, unless you're really getting into plein air painting in a big way, don't start there, because you won't go. <laughs> it's too much hassle. All right, sketchbooks. Ugh. Okay, so I have a list on the, um, on the handout of some of the ones that I've tried. I'm going to show you a, a sort of a pile of them, but I think the best thing to do is for me to talk about this in a general way. Um, there are sort of 
three categories of watercolor sketchbooks. There are things that are made for light washes, stuff like this uh, Aquabee Super Deluxe sketchbook. You can put a light wash in this, but um, and so line of wa line of wash works fine. But if you try to put a wash over the whole page, I don't think I have an example, but if you try to put a wash over the whole page, it does not take a, a wash really that well. And that's typical of sketchbook paper. You're going to find even ones that are supposedly for watercolor, are um, they don't stand up to a lot of water. So this one falls in that category. This is the handbook. Um, watercolor version it would be in that same category it'll take a reasonable a, a light wash uh, I think those are the only two that I have in that category um, another that's in that category would be the uh, Strathmore uh, visual journaling watercolor uh, the Canson watercolor um, sketchbooks then there is the American Journey watercolor sketchbook this is a bit heavier this is a hundred and forty pound paper but it does not, um, so you can see it'll take a wash and not be too streaky and bloomy, but it still doesn't handle like studio paper. It, it, none of these are gonna handle that well. So you're gonna get some, uh, some blooms, some muddy color, but it's a step up from the lighter weight paper. My favorite is the uh, Stillman and Byrne sketchbooks and there are five or six series and um, you probably won't remember this but I'll tell you there's it's the beta, gamma, or zeta series that you want. Those are the heavyweight ones and they just have different um, surfaces. Uh, a couple of them are cold press, one of them's hot press, so I'll let you read the handout if you want those. But I like them, but again, um, so you'll see it takes, it takes a wash reasonably well, but it still doesn't handle like a studio paper would. But it's still pretty nice, and I use the hot press version because I use mine as my journal as well as my sketchbook, so I'm doing a lot of writing in there and I like the hot press for that. So what if you really would like to have it be like the paper you use all the time in the studio and not have to settle for sketchbook paper? Well there's a couple of solutions that, that I've been using. One is you can just tear some paper down to size and bind it yourself. So this is bound by, so there are two you don't have to be a book binder to do this. There are two signatures in this book, and each one is, um, I think it's four folded in half. And then I've just punched holes and they're sewn across just one big, when I say sewn, they're really just tied. It's just one big loop that goes through. And that works just fine. So if you do any book binding, if you know how to do like Coptic binding or something like that, then you can make a really classy one. And this surface is a piece of um, canvas that I painted some acrylic on that I didn't like the painting, so I just cut it up. And there's my magic Velcro dots again. And then these tails serve as a sort of a bookmark. So that's one solution is to make your own um, because the ones that are someone else makes for you are super expensive and this will take you an hour at the most to put together something like this find you don't have to use a piece of painted canvas you could use anything else a piece of book cloth a piece of heavy paper works and make yourself a sketchbook if you're thinking no i want to be painting not making crafts the other solution that I've used, and this one doesn't happen to have watercolor paper in it, but these disc-bound notebooks that used to be kind of hard to find but are everywhere now. You can get these at Staples, and you can buy just the discs, and you can buy a punch that punches these holes. And so then you can make your own, sort of like a spiral bound, 
But the nice thing about these is if you haven't ever used one before, pages just pull right out and pop back in. So you can rearrange them just like you would with a three ring binder, but it's a little bit more like a spiral binder. And watercolor paper holds up to that really well. So you can just get a bunch of watercolor paper and buy the punch once and the discs and make yourself as many sketchbooks as you want. And then if you have one that turns out really well, you can pull it out and frame it very easily. Um, the third alternative to the bind your own method would be to take a bunch of watercolor paper of your favorite type over to your local uh, print shop and ask them to spiral bind it for you. Most print shops have that binding surface avail service available and that's also going to be cheaper. The, the solution I actually like best is when I want to paint on paper that's like what I normally paint on, I just take it loose like this. So um, one problem with that is if you're going on a trip or something and you want to make like a travel journal out of it, then you have all these loose pages instead and you have to glue them in, but you don't actually. If you make it just a little wider, and I think, Carolyn, I think you might have given me this book. This might have been a gift from Carolyn. I, I think it was. Um, this, this is obviously way bigger, but this is a post-bound book. And so what you can do is take the loose sheets and then you can buy these posts. They, there are posts that go through uh, four holes in the side and you can buy the covers and the posts in um, places that do like uh, memory journals and photo albums and stuff like that. And they just, you punch a hole, you put this in and you screw the two pieces together and it makes a very nice polished looking presentation. So that allows you also to work on real watercolor paper and bind it after you're done. So let me pause a moment and see where are we in. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of the supplies that I use. So I want to take um, the last few minutes of the formal presentation to talk about what do you do when you get on location. Here we are, we're ready to paint, and we get something like, thanks. So this is the kind of scene that you encounter where um, you, you get on location and it's like there's so much that you could make a sketch of that it's kind of overwhelming and you, you wind up taking 500 photos and coming back to the studio later and trying to figure out, but you don't actually sketch on location. So I, you know, I, I can't see you, but raise your hands if you've been there. I mean, I think we've all done that. So here's my solution to that. I do something when I first get on location that I call exploratory drawing. And that's just my little term for this. I don't know, probably there's a, a correct term, but I don't know what it is. And this is just copy paper. And I take copy paper because I don't want to feel like I'm going to mess up a page in my beautiful journal. So I'm looking at the scene and I'm not really looking much at the paper. It's almost like blind contour drawing. And I'm just seeing what catches my eye and I'm getting my eye and my hand moving. And I don't really care right now if I'm making a scene. I might sketch for a little while some of the shapes that I see in the boats and then I might go, oh, I, you know, I kind of like those pine trees or those palm trees in the distance. Let me play with that for a little bit. I like the shape of this cluster of palm trees. So what I'm doing right now is I'm giving myself a chance to explore options without committing yet to a particular composition or a particular subject or the entire scene in front of me. And I'm getting my hand moving. I'm starting to see, oh, you know, okay, there's some interesting boats over on the other side. Now that doesn't even look like a boat, but that's okay because right now I'm just exploring with my artist's eyes. If I stand here and just look at the scene, I don't look in the same way as I do when I actually start drawing. When I start drawing, I start going, oh, gee, I see that this the shape of those boats at that perspective. 
So yeah, I'm I'm just so you I, you'll have to kind of just mentally uh, keep the idea of what that scene looked like. But I'm just exploring things, and I'm not drawing where they would be. You know, I might see something like, oh, you know, let's let's look at that cell tower over there. It's I'm not drawing them in position. I'm just exploring the scene and starting. Part of part of what this does is it gives me a chance to start getting my hand moving. It gives me a chance to consider possibilities, and it stops me from jumping to the most obvious scene first. And I start to see details that I didn't see before, and I actually start to think about how can I compose this? What do I want to include? So that's a, a very quick introduction to this, but I think what a lot of times happens is people get on location and they start going, where's a scene that I can draw? How am I going to draw this scene? Okay. And, and suddenly you've got five million details and you can't manage them all. So this gives me an option to say, look, I'm on location. I don't have time to draw everything I saw in there, but I could do this cluster of palms. You know, maybe I could do that. And, and then maybe I could take this boat and kind of bring it up, you know, closer to the cluster of palms and have some water and some sky, and that would make a good little postcard. So I'm starting to solve some problems and I'm not committing myself to, oh, I got to have a thumbnail drawing so I know what the boundaries are at the beginning. What I can do is say, okay, so if I wanted to keep this part, how would I want to compose that? Maybe I'd want to use a composition like this. And I'm just going to ignore that I already drew some other things there. This lets me think things out. And that took, even talking about it and playing around, that talk took not very much time and investing that little bit of time in playing around and exploring options before I start to paint allows me to land on a subject that I might be able to put on a postcard. Another thing I do is I tell myself, okay, what could you write on a postcard? If you're writing to friends, you know, I'm going to send a postcard back from here. On the back of the postcard, I can write, you know, hey, here I am in Mexico, wish you were here, the weather's beautiful, and I'm out of room. I can't write anymore. And yet, when we paint, we try to like get in here with our brush and paint every tiny little detail like we're writing a novel on the postcard. So this helps me remember it's a postcard. I can only pick a couple things if I think about like, what would I say if I wanted to give somebody a little of the flavor of this scene? I might say, oh, I'm sitting in this great location and the sun is on the palm trees and there's these beautiful boats. And that's all I can really put on a postcard. So that's all I should put visually on the postcard either. I tell myself either the big picture with just the big shapes, like the skyline or the the distant horizon or one interesting detail. So I'm going to go back to these guys. So this is what I mean by sort of the big picture with no detail or one interesting detail. And, and just so you also see that, you know, it's do as I say, not as I do. This was the first one. <laughs> As I got there, I tried to put in, she's back, I tried to put in every little boat and all the buildings and everything, and this is not successful. I mean, if you compare, this is where I started, and then I kind of calmed down and went, no, 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 no. You need to pick either, like, here's just the edge of the mountain, the moon, and some lights in the distance. So there's nothing really going on there except a big silhouette, silhouette of the of the opening of the river here, one little bird, the distant mountains, the shapes of the mountains kind of, but no details. So I try to tell myself when you're on location and you're sketching, it's the big picture, just the big shapes and no detail, or it's one interesting detail. Thanks for watching this recorded version of my Second Sunday Live demo for 10 March 2019. If you'd like to know about future Second Sunday Live demos, sign up for my newsletter at dragonflyspiritstudio.com. Happy painting!